Good evening. We're going to learn the Sicha, the first Sicha of Volume 11 of the Kutu Sichas. And this Sicha is going to be uh, a key, an opening to a discussion. We're going to obviously along the way answer various specific questions, but it's also going to be an opening, um, an introduction to one of the very um, important and key elements of the Rebbe's Chassidus of the, the Chassidus Chabad, specifically um, a element of it, which is um, receives great attention, greater attention than earlier by the Rebbe in many places, and it's a very deep and subtle concept, and in in emphasizing and underscoring and appreciating the deep connection that Jews have with that a Yid has with Hashem, um, and hopefully we're going to get a window into it today. So let's start out. Um, we start off by looking at two Pesukim. First Pasuk in this week's Pasha. This is when God uh, meets, uh, addresses Moses in the burning bush, and he's sending him on the mission to Egypt and to address the Jewish people in Egypt. And Hashem says to Moses, I will be that, that what I will be. And the way the Medrash, there's obviously many meanings to this Pasuk, but the way the Medrash that we're discussing today understands this Pasuk is that I will be that what I will be. I will be God to those who welcome the opportunity, those who are receptive to me being their God, to them I will be God. Those who, um, th those who refuse to accept that, so they will be on their own. Okay, that's the Medrash understanding of this Pasuk. Now, there's another Pasuk, and, and this, is, this, is, this Pasuk sort of in, introduces the whole message of, of, of Hashem to the Jewish people in Egypt, introduces the whole notion of redemption from Egypt. And so to say, if you want to come along in this ride, if you want to accept me as God and come experience the Exodus, then I'm here for you. If you don't want to, then you'll be left to your own. There is a, another Pasuk, and this Pasuk is from the book of Yechazkel, the prophecy of Yechazkel. As I live, says the Lord God, surely with a strong hand and with an outstretched arm and with um, pure, poured out fury will I reign over you. So this Pasuk, in reference to the future redemption, is saying that actually Hashem is going to rule over us with a strong hand, with an outstretched arm, and the Medrash understands this to mean that whether or not we're receptive to it, whether or not we're accepting of it, Hashem is going to take us out of, 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 of God, Hashem is going to take us out from the exile. So even though this Pasuk in Yechazkel is referring in the literal sense to the future redemption, but nevertheless, the Medrash understands that it's also relevant to the um, exodus of Egypt. Don't forget, this is the Navi Yechazkel talking many years after the exodus of Egypt. But nevertheless, the Medrash understands that this is also expressing a sentiment or a, an element of the exodus from Egypt. And so these two psukim stand in contrast to each other, where the Pasuk in this week, Sedra, seems to say that the exodus of Egypt and the relationship with Hashem that is a part and parcel of that is somewhat up to, um, up to choice. And if somebody uh, resists it, then he, he won't be redeemed from Egypt and he won't be engaged in that relationship with Hashem. And the Pasuk in Nechazkel seems to imply that there is no, there's no way out. Hashem is going to rule over us and take us out and redeem us, whether, we're, whether we like it or not. So how does the Medrash reconcile this? The Medrash says, Rabbi Yochanan said, I am, that I am is to individuals. But regarding the multitudes, regarding the, the, the general populace, I will rule over them even against their will and desires, even though they break their teeth. So break their teeth is sort of metaphoric for, in other words, even it, as far as the multitude, as far as the general um, community of the people of Israel is concerned, even if they quote unquote break their teeth, even if they are resisting uh, the relationship with Hashem, Hashem says, I will rule over you even beyond Chazaka with, an, with a strong, with a strong, with an outstretched arm and with a mighty hand. 
but concerning individuals, um, uh, concerning individuals, um, indeed, that's what the pasuk says: "I will be that I will be." How does this pan out in actual in the Exodus of Egypt? So there was a the, the, there was a notion that in general, I mean, we see actually here in Rashi the, at the very end of this week's parsha, um, where Hashem says to Moshe, "Sorry." Now you will see that I will do for, for, for with a mighty hand, he will send them out, and with a mighty hand, he will drive them out of his land. So Rashi says, For a mighty hand, he will let them, for a mighty hand, he will let them, uh, he will drive them out of his hand. Against Israel's will, he will drive them out, right? In other words, as far as the whole people of Israel is concerned, there may have been some room that they didn't want to go out and they wanted to have stayed in Egypt, or they didn't like the timing of the Exodus, or they didn't like the manner of the Exodus. But nevertheless, Beyond um, Hazaka, with an outst- against their will, with a strong, with a mighty hand, Hashem um, makes sure, sees to it that they leave Egypt and come, and and they're part of the Exodus. And indeed, we also find, uh, okay, well, well, let's leave it at that for now. But if there are individuals who resist, so individuals can there are there are exceptions to the rule. And indeed, we find we are taught that. Um, during that the where are we? that the, the those Jews who did not want to leave Egypt they perished in Egypt and they did not leave so there may have been other transgressors who came along as part of the Exodus um, and Hashem ruled over them so to speak with an outstretched arm with a strong hand against the will but those Jews who specifically resisted and did not want to leave Egypt they um, they were left behind and they perished in Egypt. And Rashi brings this um, in the plague of darkness. Um, in the plague of darkness, we find that the Jewish people who the, 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 those Jews who deserved to perish because they were resisting and they did not want to leave Egypt, um, they stayed behind and they perished during those days of, of, of the plague of darkness. Now, how do these things, how do these two things match up? So why is it that every Jew goes out of Egypt, even those Jews who were, or let's put it like this, why is it that the people of Israel go out of Egypt, even though there were amongst the people some who did not, who were not, who were undeserving? Um, for example, there's the idea of Pasal Micha. Um, where do we have that? It should be in this source sheet. Here we go, All right? When Moshe wrote the name of Hashem and threw it into the, into, into the Nile to bring up Yosef's coffin, Micha came and silently took it. This is what the verse says, and trouble shall pass through the sea. When the Holy One, blessed be he, took the Jews across the sea, Micha crossed over with them in the name of Hashem, which he used to make a golden calf. So there was this um, holy plate which had a divine name of God inscripted on it. And that was used to miraculously bring the coffin of Yosef up from the Nile. And that was taken with them, and that was used to create the golden calf. So clearly there were people who participated, who were, who were participants in the Exodus, who were not the most devout Jews and the most um, firm believers and uh, connected, connected with Hashem. So why is it that all these tr- sinners and idolaters were redeemed from Egypt, and yet, at the same time, those who were those who were resisting, who explicitly did not want to leave Egypt, they were not. Re- they they did not come out of Egypt. Furthermore, uh, it, what, in other words, what's worse, at, at face value, one could certainly make the case that idolatry is much worse than not wanting to leave Egypt, right? So why is it that specifically the the 
let's say the transgression or the or the the blemish of not wanting to leave Egypt, that was something which was a make it or break it, and nothing else was. Now, on, on a more fundamental level, why why did every Jew get to leave Egypt, even those who were not in such an obvious way connected? So as the Torah says in this week's parsha, go to Hashem tells Moshe, go to Paroi, and say, so says Hashem, that my firstborn son is Israel. And so I say to you that my son, um, send out my son so that he shall worship me. And as we are familiar with, from the very beginning, the second chapter of Tanya, well, the Rebbe elaborates at great length that whole parak about the idea of just like a child has an intrinsic connection with the father, with his father, in that he is really just a product of his father, biologically and um, therefore sort of essentially the child is a mere extension of the father um, and so too is the relationship of an Hashem with Hashem that he is a mere extension of the father in fact uh, elsewhere not in Tani but in the Kutatari the Alter Rebbe elaborates that the connection between a Yid and Hashem it, even, even within the father-son relationship between a Yid and Hashem the um, relationship is deep, in other words, the metaphor and the name and 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 the and that and the, the metaphor of the father son doesn't truly um, bring out the relationship of Yid and Hashem because in the metaphor, the father and the son at the end of the day are two different individuals, whereas in the nimshal of the uh, a Jew or Neshama with Hashem, the Neshama is truly part and parcel or one with Hashem. Um, that's why, for example, a, uh, a person is not obligated to give his life for his father, but he is obligated to give his life for Hashem. So being that the relationship between Hashem and the Yidin is that of a father and a son, and this, uh, this, the nature of this relationship is what serves as the foundation for the whole notion of the exodus of Egypt, as we find here that he says, my firstborn son is Israel, send out my son. So it makes sense, therefore, that, it makes sense, therefore, that everyone left Egypt, because even if you're not behaving very well, you're still a child. We pass him that even a Jew, as far as he may go, is still a Jew, and even the most the worst possible of all Jews still um, has the halacha of the Jews and it has practical ramifications in all sorts of areas in halacha. Um, is a Kohen allowed to go to his grave? Um, is his uh, marriage valid? All sorts of halachic ramifications and certainly from a Chassidus perspective that this is a, f- a fundamental relation with Hashem which cannot be undermined. So and this, ha- having said that, it makes a lot of sense that all Jews went out of Egypt, even the Pesel Micha, even those who were idolaters and all sorts of other sinners and transgressors and lowly people. The question is, why were those who did not want to go out of Egypt, why is that? Okay, so they didn't want to, they were comfortable, they didn't like the change, they didn't want the hassle. Why is that considered such a terrible thing that those Jews and those Jews only did not deserve to go out? And the answer briefly is that the answer briefly is that the fact that the Jewish people are the child of Hashem was true all along. In other words, all the time that the Jews in Egypt, that was the fact. But it wasn't necessarily revealed. It wasn't necessarily apparent. And the, um, what the Exodus accomplishes or manifests is that that relationship that a yid has with Hashem as a fa- parent and a child, as a father and a child, as a parent and a child, becomes openly manifest and tangible. And so therefore, if you're doing something that you're doing an Avera, you do Avera or whatever other Avera, so it's a terrible thing to do, but it doesn't undermine the relationship of a father and a child 
which is beyond, which is runs deeper. Yeah, blood is the thickest thing; it runs deeper. Um, nothing, no transgression that a Jew does can undo or undermine the fact that he has a child of Hashem. Much like in the, even in the metaphor of a father and a child, nothing can undo the fact that he's a child, and even a wayward son is still a child. So, so too. In, and even more, this, uh, even more so in our relationship with Hashem, any Avera and any terrible thing that a Jew does doesn't undermine or negate the relationship that he has with Hashem as a father and child. And therefore, B'ni B'chayri Yisrael, you are my child, so you're going to come out of Egypt. But if somebody doesn't want to go out of Egypt, if somebody is resisting that, in other words, he's resisting, yes, there's nothing you can do about the biological connection between a father and a child. It's always going to um, remain. You can't divorce a father, you can't divorce a child, but you can choose to behave otherwise. And so if you don't want to, if, you, if you're a thief, or even if you're an Evidavid Zara, you're not negating the father-child thing, you're just not behaving like a wayward son. But if you're resisting coming out of Egypt, if you don't want to go out of Egypt, in other words, what you're saying is you don't want the father-child relationship to be manifest. If you don't want the father-child relationship to be manifest, then you're undermining the very foundation and the basis for Exodus. And in order to give um, perhaps some more concrete tangibility to this idea, the Rebbe brings a halachic concept where we see this. There is the idea that Yom Kippur atones, the, 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 on the, the day of Yom Kippur, um, has an inherent power, potency to um, to atone for our sins, um, and that, by virtue of it, uh, of Yom Kippur tapping into a very deep relationship with, that we have with Hashem, that atones for all the sins. Now. We're going to talk here about the opinion of Rebbe. It's a little bit beyond the scope to go into different opinions, but the point that we're bringing out follows the opinion of Rebbe. The opinion of Rebbe is that Yom Kippur atones for all, any Avera that a person does is atoned for by Yom Kippur, even if he does not repent. Even if he doesn't do Teshuvah, he doesn't have any remorse, he doesn't, nothing. Just the fact that you're, um, you're living through the day of Yom Kippur, that in and of itself provides atonement. There's one exception. The exception is Kharis the Yoima. That if a person if a person this is this is the wrong translation, but anyway, if a person violates Yom Kippur, if a person doesn't fast in Yom Kippur, if a person does forbidden activities on Yom Kippur, then Yom Kippur will not atone for that. And again, Similar to the question we asked before about the Exodus of Egypt, the question is why? If Yom Kippur is such a strong connection that a Yid has with Hashem, that surpasses the, um, the, surpasses the disconnect, that, that is stronger than the disconnect that any Avera could possibly accomplish, and therefore Yom Kippur atones for any Avera under the sun, well, so what if he doesn't fast in Yom Kippur? Why shouldn't Yom Kippur atone for that? I mean, surely, there are worse transgressions out there than not fasting in Yom Kippur. Right? If he's an um, idolater and a blasphemous and a low life and think then Yom Kippur is going to atone for him. But if he was so hungry and he couldn't control himself and he took a bite in Yom Kippur, then Yom Kippur is not going to atone for him. It doesn't, what's shot? Why is that so? So the answer is similar to what we said before. That in, and in the words of Halacha, we say, the defendant, sorry, the prosecutor cannot become the defendant. In other words, why, the reason why it was forbidden for you to eat today is because it's Yom Kippur. The pro, the, the, Yom Kippur created that prohibition. So Yom Kippur can't at the, create a prohibition and at the same time, atone for that very prohibition. It's, it's, a, it's a, sort of an oxymoron. And so we're not saying that, so in other words, Yom Kippur is, 
manifests the deep relationship that a Jew has with Hashem, which is so, so to speak beyond the blemish that any Avera can do, and, the, and Yom Kippur fixes that blemish. But if you, but Yom Kippur dictates that you shouldn't eat on Yom Kippur. And if you go ahead and eat on Yom Kippur, what you're saying is, I don't want that relationship to be manifest. And so we're not saying that eating Yom Kippur is necessarily worse than being an idolater. But eating a Yom Kippur is rejecting what Yom Kippur has to offer. Being an idolater is a terrible thing, but you're not explicitly rejecting what Yom Kippur brings to the picture. When a person violates Yom Kippur, he eats Yom Kippur, or he does forbidden activities on Yom Kippur, whatever it is, then he is rejecting Yom Kippur, and that's why Yom Kippur can no longer atone for him. And so the same idea is true when it comes to when it came to the Exodus of Egypt, that that, um, the, that the Exodus of Egypt, the, the basis and foundation for the Exodus of Egypt was the father-child relationship that a Jew has with Hashem. And so if that surpasses anything and therefore all Jews came out of Egypt, the Yod Chazaka with a strong hand, Hashem rules over us, even if we were not receptive to it. But if a person didn't want to leave Egypt, in other words, if the person is um, resisting and opposing to the father-child relationship becoming manifest, so then, much like in the case of Yom Kippur, so too in the case of the Exodus of Egypt, those Jews did not come out of Egypt. Okay, so now let's move on to the future redemption, the redemption of Mashiach. So even though we had these two, um, so to speak, uh, contradicting psukim, and where we're here, right? One pasuk which says that Hashem sort of only um, will engage in the relationship if to those who want to. And the Pasuk from Yechezkel, again, talking about the future redemption that says that it's for everybody. And the Medrash that says that in the, an individual can, so to speak, break off from the nation and resist redemption. But that does, not, nevertheless, that does not hold true for the future redemption. The future redemption, it's we find explicitly that every single last Jew will be included in that process. Let's look at a couple of the sources um, that say this. First of all, this is very important because, okay, so first of all, there's this one. The Pesach says, <speaking in Hebrew> So the Pesach says, that you will return to the Lord your God, your God. Um, and then the next Pesach says, <speaking in Hebrew> That Hashem will in turn bring you bring you back you to exiles and have mercy upon you and bring you back. So Rashi over here says yeah, that every single Jew is included upon this. Further lesson may be learned from the unusual form of the verb. Da, da, da. The day in which Israel exiles will be gathered is so monumental that the, will, this ingathering will be such a difficult procedure, as it were, that it is as though God himself must literally take each, indivi um, each individual Jew with his very hand, taking him out of his place in exile, right? So every single Jew in exile yeah, every single individual, Hashem is going to take him, so to speak, by the hand. Now, when we say that every Jew coming out will, will, will leave exile, it doesn't just mean that every Jew will be part of this second verse, that Hashem will take them out of the land and will return them from their captivity to the land. But it also means that every Jew is included in this first verse, that, they, that you will return to the Lord your God. You will return to the Lord your God is the basis and the precursor to the redemption. So when Hashem says that every single Jew will come out of Godless, what we mean is that every single Jew will ultimately be inspired to return to God. And this is the way the Rambam um, words it. Um, 
כבר הבטיחו אותו אירו. The Torah has long assured us that since in the end, at the close of the period of exile, Israel will return to repentance and be, moment, and be immediately redeemed, even as, it, um, even as it is said that it shall come to pass, when all these things come upon you, the blessings and the curse which I have set before you, and you shall think to yourself, and you shall, why is he bringing the whole pasuk? Let's go to the next one. You shall return to the Lord your God and hearken to his voice, according to all that which I commanded you this day, you and your children, with all your heart and with all your soul. And then the Lord your God will turn your return your captivity and have compassion upon you, right? So the Torah has assured us that at the end of Galos, these two steps of the process will happen, that you will return to the Lord your God and the Hashem will bring you back. And again, the Alter Rebbe in Tanya also paraphrases this and finishes off by saying, um, since it is certain that he will ultimately repent, whether in this incarnation or in another, in other words, whether in this lifetime or another, because no one, not anyone, will be banished from him by his sins or will remain banished. So when it comes to Mashiach, we are told, unlike the Exodus of Egypt, where somebody who resisted perished in Egypt and was not part of it, in the time to come, not a single Jew will be left behind as the famous song goes. Why the difference? Why is there such, why, why is that the difference? Why is it that when it came to Mitzrayim, somebody who resisted the father-son relationship perished in Egypt? And when it comes to the future redemption, we say that everyone will come out of it, come out of Gauss. A similar question A similar idea is very uh, commonly shared on the Haggadah, right? In the Haggadah, on the Satan night, we say to the, to the wicked son, Yeah, let's read this inside the translation. As discussed several times, response, several times, the response to the wicked son in the Haggadah is nuanced. The Haggadah says, if he were there, he would not have been redeemed, right? This response seems baffling. What is the need for and the purpose of telling the wicked son something that has no connection to the Seder, which is the remembrance of the Exodus of Egypt? Everything we do on the Seder night is supposed to remember the Exodus of Egypt. So uh, telling the wicked son that had he been in Egypt, he would not have been redeemed. So in other words, you're telling him you shouldn't even be participating in the Seder. Why, well, that doesn't seem to be very, uh, besides the antagonistic element of it, it doesn't seem to belong in the Seder when we're commemorating the Exodus. But actually, the intent of this response is not to bar the wicked son from the Seder by proclaiming that he would not have been redeemed, but quite the contrary. The, em the emphasis is on the word there. In Egypt, he would not have been redeemed. But concerning the future redemption, since it takes place after the giving of the Torah, right? This, this phrase is key. After the giving of the Torah, that's what makes the difference. He too will be redeemed. Consequently, this awakens an awareness in the wicked son of the wondrous impact of the giving of the Torah from the time Hashem said, I am Hashem your Lord in the singular I am Hashem, your Lord, in the singular you. That Havai, the most um, sublime revelation of Hashem, should become your personal strength and energy of each and every Jew. Therefore, every Jew has even a bad person like the wicked son is guaranteed that through this strength, he will ultimately be redeemed. So on the, on the, on the, 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 on the contrary, we're telling the wicked son that only in Egypt you would not have been redeemed. Over there you wouldn't have been redeemed. But now that we're after Matan Torah, you would have been redeemed. And therefore that's encouraging him that he should participate in this experience of the Exodus that we relive every year on the Seder night and perhaps also in preparation or anticipation of the future redemption. So somehow it's Matan Torah, it's the giving of the Torah that makes the difference. So because even though the Exodus of Egypt happened before Matan Torah, and that's why indeed by the Exodus of Egypt we find that the foundation and the basis for redemption was like we said, B'ni b'chayri Yisrael, send my son so that he may worship me, and therefore somebody who resisted the, the who resisted it um, in, didn't come out of Egypt, 
But Matan Torah somehow created an even deeper relationship with Hashem, a relationship that a Jew has with Hashem, which runs even deeper than the father-son relationship. And because of this even deeper relationship, this cannot be resisted. Even if you try to resist, it's just not going to work. You're not going to be able to resist. And at the end of the day, everyone will do teshuva. Everybody will return to be connection with Hashem and be a part of the redemption. Now, the key element of Matan Torah is that Hashem chose us to be his people. Uh, one of the places where we see this is the Halach and Shulchan Aruch, um, that when we say before Shema, the very, just a few, a few lines before the Shema in the morning, we say the words of Vonu Vachartam Mikolam Veloshin, that you chose us from all um, the people. So Hashem choosing us now, we say that when you say those words, you should have in mind Matan Torah. So the, the, the revelation of Sinai. Hashem chose us. Now, what Chassidus has to say about the word choose is, is, is something very deep and quite subtle. And essentially, the word choose doesn't really express that. We don't have a, a word in English that truly translates what the concept of Bechira is. But essentially, what it means is like this. And again, this is what I was alluding to earlier, that this is a very deep concept in the Rebbe's Chassidus, which is very broad and very vast. And um, hopefully we're going to have an introduction at least some, some of an insight into this over here right now. When you have a relationship between two people, so we're used to thinking of the father of the parent-child relationship to being the ultimate. So if you, if you, if you think of a spectrum of why a person would relate to somebody, there could be a very, um, pragmatic or external type of relationship, which is, I like to be connected to you because I get benefit from you. You give me money, you give me pleasure, you give me whatever it is. You give me, what, you, 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 you provide me with a thing that I found useful. And in that case, it's an extremely external relationship. I'm not really connected with you as a person. I'm connected with that which you give, your money, right? And it's not really me who's connected with you. It's the 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 the, the element of me that uses money, right? That, that uses money. So it's an external, non-essential part of me that is connecting with a non-essential part of you. Now there could be various levels in this. We could go even deeper. Let's say a connection that I have because I really admire a person's. Uh, uh, qualities. He's, he's very smart. And I, I really admire scholarship. So I'm, I, 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 I'm attracted to him. Now, that's already knowledge. Scholarship is, 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 is deeper than just, you know, some utilitarian thing. There's something more sublime about that. But still, that's not the essential person himself. It's still something which is, uh, you know, this person became a scholar. At one day, once upon a time, he wasn't a scholar. And had he remained in his not a scholar, I would not be attracted to him. So he's perfected himself and become a scholar. And that's why I'm connected to him. So again, it's not really the core essence of who the person is. Anyway, we could go on more and more levels. But the, the deepest core level that we're used to thinking of is the father-child relationship where the child is a mere extension of the father. It's the actual essence of the father that is manifest in the child. And that's, again, both biologically and uh, conceptually, that is the fact the child is an extension of the father, is part of the father. And um, that is the most deep connection that a person can, that two people can have with each other. But in all of these, in all of these examples, right, when you have something that's from the outside, that's, uh, that's um, compelling the relationship, 
something on the external that's, in fact, that word in English, compelling, is a very useful word over here. Because I'm compelled in the, in the relationship, for example, if you're, if you're very smart and I'm very attracted to scholarship, so it's not really me freely choosing to engage in the relationship. It's something is compelling me to do so. My inborn natural obsession or attraction, my, my, my inborn natural attraction to scholarship is so to speak compelling me to engage in the relationship. And the more essential something is, the more pure something is, the less sophistication that something has, the more pure it is, the more essential to me it is. So for example, um, I'll just move back a second, right? So if I'm, if, if there's an, if, if there is something compelling me into it, if there, it's, it's not pure me. It's some, there's something that's compelling me into it. Now, in human experience, that might be better. In other words, I don't know if you want pure me. Pure me, the core me, I don't know if that's going to be so amazing. Um, once you strip it, once you strip something of any definition, right? That's that's the key over here. That any definite, the more the the more the more you define something, the more something has a definition, and it has rules that it goes by. The less pure essential it is, the less core it is, and the deeper you get, the more you get into the me myself the essence of me, or in this case, the essence of Hashem, the less sophistication there will be, the less detail there will be. And whereas in the case of a human being, that might not be so attractive because who, I don't know if you want more of me, the raw me, maybe that's not going to look so good. But in the case of Hashem, that's pretty awesome. The essence of Hashem himself. So when we say that Hashem chose us in Matan Torah, we are saying that that's something even deeper than the father-son relationship. Because a father-son relationship, because it's beteva, because that is just the nature of, of it, that the child is an extension of the father. So it's the father or the son is kind of compelled into that relationship. And when you're compelled into something, you're not choosing it freely. So it's something external, so to speak, imposing the relationship. Now, of course, it's not external, like you say, like I like scholarship, so I'm attracted to a scholar. It's something much more intrinsic. The father-son relationship is certainly much more intrinsic than that. But Chassidah so says that at the end of the day, there is some level of something um, you know, the, the father-son relationship, there's something over there that is, de which defines the way this relationship works. In other words, the natural way is that a father and a son have a relationship. And because it's defined by something, um, it is not so, it's not 100% pure. Whereas when we say that at the beginning of the Torah, Hashem chose the Jewish people, and again, the word cho chose, the way Chassidus explains it, is not something that we really have a parallel for it. Um, uh, you know, uh, there's a joke or the saying that they say, you could tell who a person is by looking at his sons-in-law, not, uh, not by looking at his sons. You know, taking, and um, nowadays the modern ear doesn't like that because you don't choose your sons-in-law, you're, hopefully your daughter chooses her husband. But if you think in the old uh, in the old way, yeah, a person who your sons are, those are your sons, you know, and you don't have a choice about that. But your sons-in-law, you choose, right? So the, many a word, many a true word said in jest. 
that is something about a choice that a person makes, and a person has a choice to even choose something which is different than what he wants, right? Like, like we said before, a, a, a son can choose to not engage in the relationship with his father, and that's indeed what happened to those Jews who perished in Egypt, right? Because you, even though the Teva is the nature, the way of the world is, that a father and a son have a relationship, it is possible to choose otherwise. And when a person chooses different than what would be natural to them, then that choice runs very deep. When a person indeed comes to a place where they choose something which is different than that would be natural to them, that, that they then act very passionately and that choice sort of permeates their very being. So when we say that Hashem chose the Jewish people at Matan Torah, what we're saying is that Hashem revealed this relationship or, or, or created this relationship, so to speak, in a way that runs much deeper than a father-child relationship. And this is also... It runs much deeper than a father-child relationship, and it runs, it, it's, it's, it's something which, which is, comes from the core essence of Hashem that cannot be defined or designated or categorized in any way, shape, or form whatsoever. And it defies everything. And, the, and this Yichad Arab also connects that with the fact that we became servants of Hashem at Sinai. Yeah, the, the ear that heard at Sinai that the Jewish people are servants to Hashem. Because even though we're used to thinking of a, a servant or a slave, the only thing, um, nevertheless, um, the, 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 the idea over here is that because the, the slave becomes one with Hashem himself, one with, the, one with the master even more than a child. Um, so, for example, uh, if you do, uh, right, uh, if you, you, you enjoy one of the Mashalim given for this is Reza Adam Kav Shaloi. The person derives pleasure from something that they themselves did themselves. Um, so you prefer to work hard and accomplish something yourself than to have somebody else do it for you. Um, and that even if that somebody else is your son, it doesn't have the same feeling of gratification as if you worked on it yourself. Um, now, what about if it's your animal that did it for you, right? If you plowed the field with your cow, you're not going to say my cow, my cow plowed the field. No, I worked hard and I plowed the field. The cow that I had was just a tool, right? And the same is true in this concept of a slave, which, again, not a really a modern thing that we can relate to, but we say that we are a bodim, we are slaves. They're translating it here as servants, but the true translation is we're like a slave to Hashem. In other words, Martin Torah created that we don't even have any identity. Just like a slave has no identity, he would be like the cow who plowed the field. And that type of relationship of not having any identity at all other than our connection with Hashem is something which the Bechira, the choosing of Hashem Rat and Torah accomplished. And this is why the when it when the time from in the time from Mashiach it would be it would be impossible for anyone to resist it because even the deep relationship of a father and a child, it is possible for the father or the child to choose to behave otherwise. But once it was chosen by Hashem's very essence to be connected to us, that invokes within, uh, invokes within us a mirror image that we are, our very core essence is connected with Hashem. And therefore, as far as a Jew may go, at the end of the day, he cannot, you know, there is no escaping this and every Jew will be connected, will be connected to Hashem and return to Hashem um, and, uh, and be redeemed in the future redemption.